Hello my friends and welcome once again to this Red Gaming Tech video. Myself and Master as always I'm here with the latest news from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours as of the 14th of March. I hope you guys are doing okay up there. It's getting kind of nuts with all the people panic buying. If I'm real with you guys, I'm more worried about that than I am about the actual <clears throat> concerns. Anyway, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about, first of all, Intel's Comet Lake. So what we have is a very interesting article thanks to Anantech, and it was thanks to a notice pasted by Intel, which will also be linked in the description alongside Anantech's article. So what do we have? Well, Intel published today a product change notification, basically saying that they're using additional assembly, test, and finish site to build the mobile variant of Comet Lake. But while doing this, they did a bit of a whoops. They accidentally told us the model number of an unannounced processor, that being the i7-10810U, which obviously is the Comet Lake U family designed primarily for notebooks. Now, unfortunately, there are no specifications mentioned. The only thing we can take away from this is that it is an upgraded version of the 10710U, which was introduced last summer, and it does use the A0 stepping, which does not support LPDDR4X memory. Now, unfortunately, that is the only thing we can really say concretely regarding the specifications of this particular processor. It is just a bunch of question marks at present, unfortunately. But it's not the only Intel thing we have. We have actually have a couple more items to get through on them, the first of which is regarding Barlow Pass second generation. So what do we actually have this time around? Well, it is a leaked slide which was posted thanks to Kamachi over on Twitter, a name Understandably, you should be very familiar with by this point, the source of many leaks, yada yada yada. Anywho, the slide basically tells us that the upcoming Barlow Pass DIMMs are going to support 3200 MTS DDR4 with a 15 watt TDP. And Intel are further saying that we're going to be seeing a 15% bandwidth improvement for Optane Persistent Memory for Cooper Lake and Ice Lake. And we're also going to be seeing Barlow Pass being based on second generation 3D exploits. So this is going to be a notable improvement over Cascade Lake Apache Pass, which had to downclock RAM to 266 MTS to match Apache Pass. Now, interestingly, we can also see on this slide that there are two variants of Barlow Pass. One is for Whitley platform and one is for Cedar Island. And the Cedar Island is only supporting up to 2933 and Whitley will support up to 4 terabytes per socket and 42 channel IMCs. And we can cast our minds back a little bit now as we saw last year that Whitley is actually going to be a mainstream platform for Cooper Lake and Ice Lake SP this year. And of course, we are expecting Barlow Pass to reach PRQ status in 2020, which basically means it's the sort of the step before we actually see it actually commercially shipping but unfortunately Intel did not confirm a launch this year. And next thing we're actually going to move over to Nvidia as we have a bit of an update regarding some Nvidia laptops featuring the super GPUs. So essentially what we have here is that we are going to be seeing a laptops featuring Intel 10th generation processors and NVIDIA Super graphics cards will be paper launched or announced on April the 2nd and will actually be available for you to purchase by April the 15th. Now unfortunately we don't actually have any more specifics than that regarding anything like pricing or anything like that but even if you're not going to be getting these particular line of or this particular line should I say of laptops it will undoubtedly bring down the price of the previous generation of Nvidia laptops and even if you are looking to get the new shiny laptops Intel 10th gen plus Nvidia Super is definitely not going to be a slouch even in a mobile configuration of course, we'll have to wait and see how true this ends up being. This is according to WCCFTech.com, by the way, in case I didn't already say. That will, of course, be linked in the description below this video. So we're going to move over now from NVIDIA to AMD and Renoir. So we actually have some benchmarks for the Renoir desktop APUs. Now, obviously, we've been talking a lot, and I do mean a lot, about the mobile uh, Renoir APUs, but we have a benchmark um, result thanks to Rogue Game over on Twitter, and of course, you can find his tweet linked in the description below this video. 
So what can we actually see in terms of the information here? Well, we see that it was on a B550 Aorus Pro Gigabyte board and the CPU clock is at 3.5 GHz with a GPU clock of 1750 MHz, DDR4 RAM at 2133. And as for the overall performance on the 3D Mark 11 result that we saw, it is 5659. Now, how does that actually tally up versus some of the other uh, Renoir parts that we know about? Well, Rogame has helpfully presided some results for the 4800U and 4700U. We do see 6309 for the 4800 and then 5713 for the 4700. So you might wonder why it doesn't actually match up to the other parts. Well, this is an engineering sample, so that is a big consideration that you really must keep in mind. And also, the RAM is an issue here. It was, again, at 2133, which would undoubtedly affect the results. So we should obviously wait for more results before we make any true judgments about what we can really expect about the desktop variants of this particular APU. So we're going to move over now to some console news, first of which regarding the Xbox Series X. Now this time around we actually have some comments from a very interesting source, that being Bruce Strahley, who was the former creative director at Naughty Dog, and he went on to talk about the GPU power of the Xbox Series X, which of course we know is going to be 12 teraflops, and he said that the processing power of this will help create more realistic renders of things like smoke, water and wind, as well as of course improving textures on things like hair and fur, which obviously has been a a big point of issue for a lot of developers. Obviously, we saw things like Tress Effects trying to improve this, and while it definitely was better, it also could potentially uh, bring down your frame rate significantly. However, he said, quote, it's always been really difficult to make really good hair, and then hair responding to different environments, hair and water, hair and wind, hair and hair gel, are all reactions that can be processed. Now, unsurprisingly, just going out a quote for a moment here, he also touched on the topic of ray tracing. Obviously, it was not something we've seen on the console space before. And he said, quote, something like a Pixar rendering system will rely heavily on subsurface scattering for flesh tones and skin. If you wanted to make something rendered like The Incredibles, where you have light coming in through the earlobes of your character, we faked it at Naughty Dog. We had all sorts of ways to simulate it, but it wasn't real. If now I can write a shader that has subsurface scattering on it and hook into the ray tracing system, then more people are going to be able to do that. More importantly, those tools will now be available for smaller studios, doing most of the heavy lifting for them, with one anonymous developer saying the Xbox Series X will allow them to do things that we couldn't even dream of before. And he went on to elaborate on this point, saying, quote, the availability of these tools and this power means there's more opportunities for people to play with styles and concepts and ideas. And hopefully there's more interesting or wacky ideas that become realised, because I was never able to play with ray tracing or some kind of dynamic global illumination. That now opens up a new opportunity to think about game design differently or experience differently. It always comes down to design decisions. We have all of this power, but the choices are what to do with it, and how do we make more games compelling and the experiences richer, and not necessarily more realism. And, you know, he has a very, very good point about this technology now being available to smaller developers. Obviously, this does mean potentially that we'll see a improvement in graphics from some smaller studios that perhaps would not have the the money to do it as well as they might like. You know, obviously Hellblade, just to give an example, was a beautiful game. And that is kind of like a indie AAA game in a way. Very small budget in comparison to normal, but absolutely a AAA quality game. I've talked about this many, many times. And obviously it still looks stunning, despite the fact that it obviously did not have millions and millions and millions of dollars. But just imagine how much more stunning it could have looked, I guess is what I'm trying to say, if they'd had this technology to kind of, you know, do some of the grunt work. You know, perhaps we could have seen more content, yada, yada, yada. You know, there's only X amount of man hours, X amount of pay that you can give these developers and, and programmers and artists and so on and so forth. You know, it's expensive to make a game. And if you have to spend less money working out how to do the lighting, you can potentially put it into DLC or more characters or, I don't know, a boob drawing hidden in the game, just to be silly. You get my point. More resources used elsewhere frees them up to be used in another place, potentially. So you can view the article where I have read these comments um, in the description below this video. It was t3.com, uh, so thank you very much to them for posting these comments. Very, very interesting. So we're going to finish things up with a report on Silent Hill and a potential reboot.
So you undoubtedly have seen that the kerfuffle surrounding Silent Hill. There were some tweets from Kojima recently and some other people at Kojima Productions which very heavily hinted on them working on some sort of Silent Hill, whether it be a remake, reboot, new game, new game or whatever. We don't know, but it was something to do with Silent Hill, potentially. Now, it wasn't confirmed, but it was kind of sort of confirmed by going like, you know, we're totally not working on a Silent Hill wink, it was that sort of thing. Anywho, we now have a new rumour regarding this thanks to RelyOnHorror.com. You can of course find their article linked below. So according to their sources, another source has corroborated that Masahiro Ito, the cre creature designer for the first four games in the series, arguably the only four good ones in the series, is indeed working on a new Silent Hill game as previously speculated. Now, apparently Sony are the driving force and the big bucks behind this actually happening, and will most likely, if this is true, see this come to fruition as a PlayStation 5 exclusive. Now, further according to Rely on Horror's sources, Keichiro Toyama, the director and writer of the original Silent Hill, and Akira Yamoka, the composer of the fantastic soundtrack for most of the series, are also returning alongside Masahiro Ito. And apparently it is going to be a soft reboot of the Silent Hill series, possibly just called Silent Hill. So that could potentially be very interesting. A soft reboot could be cool. I think as long as they don't try to retell the story of Harry Mason or James something, it will be just fine. Because I don't think trying to remake Silent Hill 2 would go well for anybody. It just wouldn't have the same charm and the same impact that the original did, I don't think. I don't think that's a game that should be really be remade, at least anytime soon. It just... I guess that's coming from a place of kind of like cautious optimism regarding this rumour because I would love a new Silent Hill and I'd love for it to be good. Like the fact that we've apparently, uh, allegedly, allegedly just stressing that, got people that originally worked on the good Silent Hill games like Keichiro Toyama, Akira Yamoka, Masahiro Ito working on this. I think the chances are good that it will actually be, you know, not a Silent Hill homecoming, which was just dreadful. Um, but I just, I don't know, I don't, I wouldn't want them to try and remake Silent Hill 2 and, and, and mess it up. Is, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I would rather a new game, restore some faith in the Silent Hill franchise, you know, get some hype around it again, and then maybe think about rebooting some of the classics. That's, I, that's what I would say. But a new Silent Hill, regardless of what it ends up being, if it's a new game, if it's going to be Silent Hills Resurrected, if it's going to be a reboot or whatever, great. Sign me up. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what this is actually going to be. Now, further according to the sources, just to finish up on this rumour, is it is apparently going to be making use of the PlayStation VR headset for the PS5. So, if that's true, that could be very, very interesting and leads to a question. Are we going to be seeing a first-person perspective like in, say, Resident Evil 7? Potentially, that could work. I mean, obviously, Silent Hill has always been a third-person game, usually with tank controls in the original three and obviously with more sort of over-the-shoulder ones in the later games, but potentially it could work. I mean, it worked for Resident Evil, so I don't see any reason offhand why it couldn't work, but obviously, let's wait and see. Now, it is worth stressing that this is not confirmed. This, While it could be true that so Sony is trying to make this happen, maybe Konami is saying no, or is you know going to say no later on down the line, or someone's going to drop out. You know, there's always a chance that something's going to go wrong somewhere. You know, it's a very long process, but fingers and toes crossed that we'll see something from them soon. Obviously, it's going to be years before we even see anything, even if this is accurate. But I'm happy to know that. We're talking about Silent Hill again. It's one of my favourite horror series, so it's going to be interesting nonetheless. Anyway, that's me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.